what a beautiful spring day. What a day to reclaim some of our liberties. It's been four years since many of us have gotten together, but one of the great things about these past four years is many of you weren't here just for a campaign. You're here for the campaign. And this is not just a presidential campaign. We know it's a campaign for our freedoms. Many of you worked on local races, on state races. Many of you are involved in state house. And you're still fighting the fight. And that's the important thing. The revolution lives. It was ignited by Ron Paul, but it lives in each and every one of you. And one of the things that people are going to have to understand about the upcoming months is there's going to be a lot of work. But a good doctor once told me, if you're not having fun when you work, don't do it. Right? So we're going to have a lot of fun these next couple months, right? <laughs> and, you know, there's all sorts of fun. A lot of us are going to go up to Pork Fest and have fun, right? <laughs> but just remember, we're also going to have to do some of the things. It's not just about being online and chatting with your friends and watching videos. There's going to be phone calls. There's going to be going door to door. There's going to be, there might even be something that makes you feel uncomfortable. But that's okay. Because one of the things that inspired me to run for office a couple of years ago, Dr. Paul was like, you know, we've got to continue the revolution. And it's really hard to get up there and vote for the Constitution all the time. And people make it sound, oh, of course, you just vote the Constitution. But it's tough because people are always asking you for things. People might even ask you for a pony, right? Everyone wants a pony. <laughs> And Dr. Paul says, not in the Constitution, no pony for you. So that's the thing we need to realize is that you have to stick to your principles and live to your word. And that's one thing that I think that everyone in his room here realizes that's important about what you do, but it's about those votes that Dr. Paul does. He's consistent every single time. So, we, many of us were here the last time, many of you discovered the revolution in the, pre, in the couple, past couple years. We're going to do things even better and stronger and faster than we did last time, right? <laughs> the time truly has come for the revolution. So, there's one thing I've been dying to say in front of a crowd for a long time. <laughs> He's catching on, I'm telling you. <laughs> so, it's also one thing I look out, I see people pouring in. And it's great to see people I've known for years. It's great to see people that I met during the last campaign. And it's great to see a whole bunch of new faces. <laughs> And we also have a lot, a lot of freshman representatives who understand the New Hampshire Constitution. A lot of them. And they've actually read the Constitution that they took the oath to. So it gives me great pleasure. There's a bunch of these great individuals on stage behind me. I'm just going to read their names and they can stand up and give a wave. So, Representative Paul Ingebrigtsen. <laughs> Representative Jen Coffey.
Representative Cam DeJean. Representative George Lambert. Representative Andrew Manus. Representative Seth Cohen. Representative Donna Mora. And a man that many of you might have remember from the last campaign is Representative Norman Traganza. So if there's a bill that you want changed, uh, you know who to talk to at the end of this thing, right? No, I'm serious. Talk to them. They love to hear from you. Some of them might talk your ear off, but, you know, just avoid Seth and you'll be fine. <laughs> He grabbed me for like 10 minutes out of the back. So, all right, how's everyone doing? You guys getting it up? <laughs> so, there's another person who was also inspired a few years ago. It's someone that I came to know, um, even prior to the campaign, we had talked about some of the things going on in New Hampshire, and the, the, the spirit of the libertarianism that thrives here in New Hampshire as the only state without an income and sales tax, right? Yeah. 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 And we talked a lot about local governments, town governments, like here in Exeter, where the thing that people in the nation don't understand is that they just don't get our New England Yankee ways, right? We love town meetings. We like to line item things, right? We like to keep our budget small. And I was involved with the Taxpayers Association, and this individual and I got to talking about his tax association, is his town. And we then became pretty good friends over the course of the next couple of years as we volunteered for the Ron Paul campaign. He was an Air Force pilot for 12 years. He's a father, he was an entrepreneur, he's a small business owner. And then he went on and he was inspired to do something that a lot of us might shy away from, but he kind of embraced it. He actually ran for Senator of New Hampshire. Yeah. And not just Senator, he, he ran as, on his principles, on his campaign, he wanted to follow the Constitution and show everything that embodies New Hampshire, and he said, I'm going to run on those principles and I'm going to win. And he did. Please welcome to the stage, Senator Jim Forsyth. Friends, today is an important day for liberty. As I stand on this stage, I am overwhelmed with how far we have come in the last four years. Through the hard work of you, the committed activist, we have truly turned the tide at the state level. It is particularly fitting that this event is taking place in Exeter, as, New Hampshire, as the New Hampshire House of Representatives has not been this packed with uh, defenders of liberty since Exeter was the state seat of government in 1775. <laughs> election to the state senate last year is also the result of hard work of many in this room and for that I am incredibly grateful and in fact Molly Brown actually sang the national anthem at my kickoff event over a year ago so it's good to see her here again. But none of this would have been possible without the 40 years of steadfast service, unwavering principles and patience that Congressman Ron Paul has exhibited. For many of us in this room he has served as both a hero and a role model showing us what can be accomplished if you refuse to back down, refuse to go along to get along. And while those of us in New Hampshire have been busy these last four years, so too has Dr. Paul. He has continued to speak of the dangers of overspending, overtaxing government that tries to solve all problems by printing more money. And people are listening for the perhaps the first time in modern American history, phrases such as gold standard, federal reserve system, and monetary policy can be overheard in everyday conversations, in restaurants, in grocery stores, on college campuses, and even in the State House. Yeah. People see the government growing, the debt growing, and the inflation of food and energy, and they are justifiably worried. 
No one, literally no one in the country could be more credible to stand up at this point and say, I told you so, than Ron Paul. But of course he doesn't say that. He does what he's always done, calmly, honestly, consistently stand up for sound monetary and economic policy, for rational foreign policy, and for the rights of the individual. And that's why we are here today, to support the man who's been a staunch defender of the Constitution, the man who never voted to increase our debt, and who turned down his government pension, the man who inspired the Tea Party movement to call for lower spending, the man who served in the Air Force and who's delivered over 4,000 babies. Please welcome Congressman Ron Paul. about attitudes about economics and foreign policy today than it was in 1976 when I was first elected. There's a big difference and it involves a lot of work from a lot of people and now that so many people in this country have come to understand that government so far in its pretense that it can take care of us from cradle to grave and police the world, it is so evident to this growing number of people that government isn't the solution, government really has created the problem. <laughs> what our opponents who often we really like to do is say, oh, you people don't even want any government. But you know, in our society, with our constitution, there is a role for government. But the Constitution was written explicitly not to restrain your behavior and your life and the way you spend your money. It was written to restrain the federal government. <laughs> but because of the educational effort and the work that so many have done, 
but also the strong evidence that there is a failure out there, especially uh, since we had s saw what happened with the housing bubble, and that was a predictable event that the housing bubble would burst. It did, as the Austrian free market economists had predicted, and because of all this, they have come together, and people are now listening to this revolutionary spirit that is spreading across this country. It's great that I'm able to announce in this state, a very special state, because there is so high respect for the spirit of liberty here, so I am very, very pleased that I am once again able to say that I am a candidate for the presidency. The atmosphere was a lot different. There was a no six election, an 08 election, and it did not uh, make all of us who believed in liberty all that happy. But boy, I'll tell you what, there has been a significant change. The people have awoken and they have sent a message, elected a lot of new people to your state legislature, and I'll tell you what, I am convinced that the spirit of liberty is alive and well in New Hampshire. <laughs> about I do this, I will do this, but I can talk generically what I think a president should be able to do and should do. One thing the American people want, and I agree with them, they want a strong president. There is no doubt about that. But the question you should ask, where should those strengths be directed? Should the strength of a president be directed toward building the TSA and Homeland Security? And of the individual should be directed towards standing up for freedom, standing up for liberty, and restraining government. That's right. There's been a lot of challenges already today and yesterday and this last week because of certain positions. I find one very fascinating in something other candidates may well deserve. And that has to do with the, with the drug issue. Because it is so symbolic of understanding what liberty is all about. When you think of uh, my position, my position is that you have a right of freedom of choice with your bodies. That, I believe, is basic uh, principle of liberty. What does that mean? If you have civil liberties and a right to your life and the right, right to your property. Well, it means that you can make very, very important choices. You, and the most, for most of these, most Americans agree with it. They say, yes, the most important thing in my personal life is that uh, I and my family and others, we make our decisions about our spiritual life and uh, about our salvation, which cannot be done by government, and we have to provide the maximum amount of freedom for individuals to make those decisions. So the government should always butt out of our spiritual lives. Intellectually, we're fairly good at that. Uh, the political correctness movement has tried to undermine it, but basically most Americans believe in the First Amendment and say that we have a right 
to talk about controversial issues. As I have often said, the First Amendment wasn't written for us to be able to talk about the weather. It's written that, so that we can discuss controversial issues and actually read very controversial and very dangerous literature, especially the literature that promotes big government and welfareism and socialism and all the mess. So we, we recognize that to be the case. But all of a sudden, people uh, have lost respect for liberty, the understanding of liberty, and we have conceded way too much to the government to decide what we put into our own bodies. If we can control what goes into our spiritual life, what goes into our intellectual life, why should we concede to the government that they decide everything that we do with our own bodies? <laughs> And uh, the government does have has very little authority to get involved in our economic or our personal lives, and so that excludes the federal government from being involved uh, if and when we become strict constitutionalists. The federal government should be involved, but that does not prohibit the states from doing some of the things that they do, even though we might disagree with it at the national level. Under the national law and the constitution, states have more prerogatives and and more more choices. But if we looked at education as an example, uh, the Constitution gives no authority for the federal government to run our educational systems, and they shouldn't be doing it. protection of freedom of choice. We should always be aware of the fact that it's very important that individuals who want to opt out, whether it's opting out of Obamacare or opting out of yeah. educational system, we have to protect the right of individuals to homeschool and go to private schools as well. choice should lead to other choices about what we put into our bodies. For instance, your right to take things into your body, such as nutritional substances, should never be regulated by the federal government and absolutely never regulated by the United Nations. what's so bad about getting the federal government out of the business of regulating unpasteurized milk. Now that's a real <laughs> But why should we be so intimidated if they want to use the issue of somebody using hard drugs as the reason that we have to give up all our freedoms? It's wrong. It's better to defend a position that says you do have freedom of choice in what you do with your body, but you also have to have responsibility for what you do. And if you do harm to yourself, you can't go crawling to the government to penalize your neighbor. disposition of the government controlling all those decisions as detrimental to progress in medicine. So often there are alternative treatments for cancer and other diseases that are not approved for years and years and years because we have to have the FDA, which is controlled too often by other drug companies, deciding when and what we can do. We, as individuals making decisions with their own physician, ought to decide about all alternative care as long as people are upfront and tell you the truth and tell you the risk and can't defraud you. personal choices and everything I've done in, in politics. I've never introduced a bill in Washington, D.C. to emphasize heroin. <laughs> so they take all of what I said and turn it around and say, who would legalize heroin? <laughs> you know, 
the, the plain truth is, is that uh, heroin at one time in our history was legalized and there was essentially no abuse of it. And it's only in our recent history. And there was a t long time in our history that marijuana was, was legalized. I happen to have a personal, real disgust with the abuse of drugs, but it's all drugs, those that are considered illegal, and I think physicians prescribe way too much medication and get too many people <laughs> down in, in uh, South Carolina was when this came up and they wanted to paint me as this monster about, about heroin, I didn't get a chance to say, well, I've never mentioned that word. I talk about liberty and freedom, but the interpretation and the inter uh, 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 is, is correct that I do want people to make choices. So in my less than 30 seconds left to make my point, I said, all right, if, if it would happen to become legal, how many of you would all of a sudden be using heroin, you know, become heroin addicts? <laughs> no, people make, make decisions and they make good decisions for the most part. But what I don't like is when the government makes the decision and it violates the principles of liberty, it's a blanket decision and it affects us in everything that we do to the point where you, you don't even know if you're allowed to drink the milk that you can buy from your neighbor farmer. So, say that uh, and, and want to paint a negative picture, stick to your guns, defend liberty, defend the free choices, defend our constitution, defend states' rights, regulations if they're necessary, as they are on alcohol. There's a few regulations in this state in alcohol. So there, it's different in different states, but at least there are different states that handle this and, and children are generally protected. In alcohol, you know, the kids in high school today can get hold of marijuana easier than they can get hold of alcohol. So it's not like you just turn it loose and dump it out there in the streets and the kids, but ultimately that, even that, doesn't solve the problem. What really solves the problem is good family relationships. Families that teach their kids <laughs> and economic and moral policy. I have taken a position for as long as I can remember, since I've been in Congress since 1976, so it's nothing new. And that is that I don't like the federal agencies breathing down our neck and regulating our property, even under the guise that they're there to take care of us and help us. So for this reason, I have opposed uh, the uh, federal government's insurance programs because they cause moral hazard. And the one that they quizzed me on today was the insurances that take care of everybody in the midst of a natural disaster. Well, natural disasters are very, very bad, and they're, and they're very, very damaging. And uh, I, I believe that they can be taken care of without the federal government going further into debt. But through this system of liberty and, and, and separate governments and state government, because the point was about flood insurance. I live on very near the Gulf Coast, they used to have a house right on the beach. Now, you, you can't buy private insurance because it's dangerous there, it's too expensive. So what happens? They have to tax you in North Carolina so I can have a beach house in Texas. And then the house gets blown down and the taxpayers pay. But they want to turn that into saying, oh, you don't care about the people suffering from a natural disaster. Well, you know, free markets, economics, and law really helps us sort these problems out. If you want to build a house on the beach and you love it, yes, buy insurance. Oh, can't buy insurance. Well, that's giving you a very important economic lesson. It's saying it's dangerous to live on the beach. <laughs> well, the people that don't live on the beach shouldn't have to pay for those of us who take the risk to live there and get a guarantee from the government. Other, in, in other ways, our, our society and our country has been great. We have been very generous when people really get hurt. Not only in this country we go to help people, but around the world. I mean, when there are earthquakes and other things, we are, we as a people have been very, very generous. 
I'll tell you what, that's going to end because our economic policies in this country is destroying our wealth. We're not going to have any money hardly to take care of ourselves like we want help the world. I am convinced that if you think, these, think things through, if you can figure out how the free market Sound economic policy and sound morality and the Constitution will help us. Does that mean no government? No, the government should be providing a sound, sound currency. They should enforce contracts. They should not be destroying your property rights. They should be protecting your property rights. Yeah. And obviously, uh, one of the most important property rights that we should always defend is the right to own a weapon to defend. Yeah. Other questions that have come up this week has to do with foreign policy, and it should be expected because I am so radical that I want to go back to the Constitution and have a foreign policy, which is a pro-American foreign policy, and not do the things that we're not authorized to do. But because the status quo, including many Republicans in the past, has drifted over to the assumption that uh, we have to be the policemen of the world. Now, I don't think the American people ever fully endorsed that idea, because even in recent history, our candidate in the year 2000 he ran on a humble foreign policy, not going into nation building. And of course, that is what I'm running on, but let me tell you, I believe it and we should do it. A lot of people would like to label us who believe in that. Oh, you're a bunch of isolationists. But tell you what, if you uh, believe in freedom of choice, you believe in trading with other people, believing that you have the right to buy goods from anybody you want, it's your money, why can't you buy the cheap goods? And uh, so you're not, you don't have to be an isolationist, it just means that we stay out of the internal affairs and all the conflicts and the civil wars and the religious civil wars, especially going on in the Middle East. I don't believe we have to be involved in that. I think we'd make more enemies for it, and it is bringing us down financially. And therefore, we need to reassess it and have a good policy. Well, it gets a little trickier because when bad policy brings bad events to ourselves, uh, such as what happened on 9-11, it's very difficult to say, oh, you know, if we wouldn't have had that foreign policy that we had, uh, we wouldn't be uh, under such attack. That, you cannot handle that, that easily because we have been attacked. There are limits. No matter what, how many mistakes we're making in the past, when, you're, when a country's attacked, a president and a country and a Congress should respond. So for that reason, I did respond by voting for the authority in 2001 to go after the individuals involved and responsible and go and get the Al-Qaeda and gave that authority. But what happened was the authority was abused. Matter of fact, it was abused and ignored. The authority to go after bin Laden was ignored at Tora Bora. Bin Laden was allowed to get off the hook and escape. At the same time, oh, we didn't worry about it too much. We decided, well, maybe there are Al-Qaeda. At least they said, there is Al-Qaeda. There are nuclear weapons aimed at us. So we have to go in and fight this war in Iraq. So what did we end up with? 10 years. 10 years of thousands of our people being killed. Tens of thousands haven't been wounded with serious injuries. Believe me, there's information coming out now that the Persian Gulf War Syndrome with the first Persian Gulf War, which took them a long time to acknowledge, is going to have massive number of people, you know, it, with those conditions coming back. Head injuries. We have a big, big problem on our hands, and that's a cost. Trillions of dollars, thousands of lives, casualties that we have, and to go after a group of people who deserve to be going after, but the cost, as far as I'm concerned, was way too high. <laughs> Although, you know, I 
supported that authority, I had deep reservations with fear that it would be misused. And therefore, I was looking around for another option. And that is when I reviewed uh, what I've learned in the, about the Constitution. And they have a provision in the Constitution that maybe we can have a narrow de defined war. Since we can't declare war against the government when it's a band of criminals that are attacking us, and that is when they uh, provided the principle of a letter of mark and reprisal. And that is target the enemy, go after them, and get them. Now, the good example of how this might work is what Ross Perot did. When he had some of his employees taken into hostage in Iran, he didn't go to the federal government and say, go in, attack them, declare war. What he did, he got some special forces, retiree. He got his people in there. He went in and got them out and brought them out. If this principle had been ingrained in our system and we, we had used it, we could have well paid $500 million or a billion dollars to capture the individuals that were responsible, and, uh, and, and yet, of course, we didn't do that. That would have been cheap compared to the trillions of dollars that were involved in now. Not only do I see some of that as a conflict in not doing well, Every time we occupy a country, every time we kill a civilian, and it, it continues, when we lob these bombs into Pakistan, civilians get killed too. They get angry at us. What would we do if that happened? And they say, well, there's maybe Taliban in there. We have to go get them. The Taliban is not the Al-Qaeda. The Taliban are a group of people who are very determined that they don't want any foreign occupation. That's their religious and political belief. And we joined them when they were so annoyed with the Soviets occupying Afghanistan, but we were on the side of those who said, no occupation. So it should be so unusual for us to come to the conclusion that if we're involved over there, that they wouldn't turn on us, and that certainly is what happened. But if you want to demonstrate the futility of our foreign policy, just think about Pakistan. We're lobbing bombs into Pakistan, Innocent people are getting killed. Maybe a Taliban member is killed, who's only arguing that he wants uh, his country back. And at the same time, we give them billions of dollars. And when we give them money, I used to say that, uh, you know, our problem in this country is we have only two foreign policies. One, if they do what we tell them, we give them money. If they don't do what we tell them, we bomb them. In this case, we're doing both. <laughs> so there, there is a lot of room for a sensible, a common sense uh, foreign policy. And it, it goes back to the Constitution. But not only is this a detriment to us uh, militarily and, and for our national security, it's a great detriment to us economically. You can't ignore these, these dollars that we're spending. Besides, I see politically the real opportunity is cut hundreds of billions of dollars out of the military industrial complex. Yeah. It doesn't help our national security. politically unpopular stand that many have on our side and say what we need to do is cut medical care for the children. I mean, that's not that's not a good point to make. It's, it's more difficult. I think all the programs should be cut. I don't vote for them because they're unconstitutional. But I still think emphasizing big cuts overseas could alleviate some of these problems in a political way that would be uh, more, more acceptable. Uh, but this is going to be worked out in Congress today. They're trying to figure out whether we should raise the national debt. And they're arguing once again, if we don't, like if we didn't come to the rescue and bail out all the rich guys in 08, it would be uh, a depression. Sure, there would have been a depression for Wall Street, but depression was dumped on the people instead. <laughs> So instead of making the correct economic policy changes, like uh, lower taxes, less regulations, a sound currency, property rights, paying off the debt, a few things like that, what did we do? We've had all these problems from too much spending and too much taxing and too much regulation, too much borrowing. 
too much printing press money, so, oh yeah, we're in trouble now. The bubble has burst, so we really have to pump harder. I mean, we have to put more money in, spend more money, borrow more money, tax more money, regulate more, and print more money. And guess what? We're not out of the recession. We're still in recession, and it's going to get worse. This foreign policy is related because it's a significant amount of our spending, and the printing of money is an important thing. There's, a lot of, there's going to be a lot of talk about inflation because inflation is here. But it's very important that we define inflation the way that the free market economists do. Inflation is when they print money and increase the money supply. The consequence of inflating a monetary system will be higher prices. Unpredictable where the, where the money goes and when it happens and to what degree because there's a lot of elements built in. But inevitably, when you devalue the currency, the prices will go up, and we're at the beginning of a big siege on, on in inflation. They say that we have to vote you know, for, the, um, for the debt increase. And by the way, I'm not going to vote for the debt. <laughs> the argument is it would be a disaster if we defaulted. Well, it is a disaster if we default, but we're in the midst of a default, and we've done it before. We've done it from the beginning of our history. We defaulted with the Continental Dollar. We defaulted with the Greenbacks in the Civil War period. We defaulted in the 1930s when the American people were denied their gold from their gold bonds that they held, and the gold was confiscated from us. And then in 1971, our promise to all foreign holders of, do of, of dollars could repatriate their dollars for gold. We disclosed when it said, we're broke, we can't do it anymore. So we default constantly. Now they're talking about defaulting that there won't be enough cash. That's not the default to worry about. The default is on you. Because the default is, they're going to print the money, the national debt will probably be raised, they're going to continue to print the money, which means that they're going to devalue your dollar and they're defaulting on you. Because if you have a savings account or a treasury bill, if you have $1,000 in it this year, and right now prices are going up closer to 10% a year, so in one year you could lose $100 out of 1000 And when it gets going, it's going to be a lot worse than that. That is a default, but they don't count it that way. They don't count it that way. That is just price adjustment. Matter of fact, it's a deliberate policy of the Federal Reserve to depreciate the currency. That's what their business is. That is why our dollar since 1913 has lost 98% of its value. That's dishonest, it's immoral, it's unconstitutional, and the reason why we ought to get rid of the Federal Reserve. The government, the Federal Reserve will print the money and keep interest rates low. So it's always there to do that. And then that facilitates the growth of government. Whether it's the growth of government to fight wars that we shouldn't be in, or fighting uh, and providing cradle to grave entitlement system. So the Fed is a culprit, and we have to address that. We cannot solve our problems without looking at the monetary issue. The great thing about what has happened in the last four years is all of a sudden the Federal Reserve and monetary policy has become an issue out on the table. That is a great victory and I thank so many of you who have helped. Though we did not get our audit the field Fed bill passed, although we did get it passed in the House, but it wasn't passed in the, um, in the Senate. But a lot has happened. We've got a partial audit, and some court cases have been beneficial. We are getting more information, and it's astounding. As much as I've anticipated it would be very, very bad,
but more than a third of these trillions of dollars that they have pumped in to help out their friends, a third of it went to overseas banks, not to the Americans who's losing their mortgage. Hey, on one bank got bailed out, and guess who was one third owner? Gaddafi was one third owner in the bank. <laughs> So this is the reason that we should direct our interest to the preservation of liberty to the people in this country and taking care of ourselves, being prosperous, set a good example, and others will want to emulate us. We cannot spread our goodness with a gun, and using a gun violates our goodness. our cause. I believe for myself that all political activity is for the promotion of liberty with a deep conviction that liberty and freedom is not perfect. It will not solve all our problems, but it will do more good than all the government intervention in the world. A lot of times terms are thrown around, conservative, libertarian, liberal, and all. I like the word intervention. I don't like to be have a government that is an intervener. The government doesn't come in and tell you what to do with your life. They don't tell you what to do with your money. And we don't tell other countries what to do with their problems either. That is the... Uh, in many ways, I believe a good president would work in the direction of uh, saying that I want to do less. But I want to firmly and courageously stand up to those who want to do more. They use an authoritarian approach, and when they do, everything that they do it undermines your personal liberty. So it undermines everything that was good and great about America. We were never a perfect nation. We don't have a perfect document. But I'll tell you what, we had the best. We were the most prosperous ever, and there's still a lot of spirit left in this country. So we are now in a struggle. We are in a struggle against those who are saying, and they're angry, we want more, don't cut our benefits, to our group who are saying, we've had enough, what we want is we want our freedom back. Yeah. The reason I work so hard for personal liberty is a very, uh, important reason is for myself, is for my family, my friends, and my neighbors in our country. Because I believe if we did have our, our liberties, we would have more prosperity. It is truly a humanitarian uh, argument because the other side, they do not uh, produce. But more importantly, I think a free society offers tremendous opportunities. It, it, it really releases us, gives us a time and the wealth to release more creative energies. And it's in these creative energies, then we can deal with our problems, whether it's our personal habits, whether it has to do with our economic uh, conditions and helping other people, or whether it's uh, dealing with other countries. We will have, have the wealth. And with this, with this effort, then we can work on our own imperfections to improve ourselves, to work on becoming more virtuous and more compassionate. And this is the society that I want to live in. So regardless, and from the very beginning, it was regardless of what happens. The goal is a very important goal. And I am so pleased to see what's happening in the country. Not only the interest in the Federal Reserve and the foreign policy, but the interest in the understanding of liberty. And where I go, the numbers are growing. And where I really get excited is when I go to the university and talk to the young people. They understand, they understand what they're getting and they understand that something different has to be done. And they also understand that whether they're in high school or in college, the burden will be falling on them. No matter what happens in the next election, this cannot be changed immediately. It can only be changed. One individual can do it. It can only be changed if the people endorse the changes and that our representatives that get sent to our legislatures understand it and, and do it. And that is where I think we're making great progress. When I first started, I had difficulty in the 1950s even finding the literature. 
I had an inclination to study and read, but it, it, it took a long time. Uh, there was no internet, the books were hard to find. Today, it is so great to use the internet to find out what's going on, more think tanks than ever before. It also, if I need a book now, I can get it about five, 10 seconds off, uh, off Amazon, out of the internet, it's in my house the next day. So big things are happening, and we have to, Take that and use it, use it for a just cause. And that just cause is promoting the greatness of America and promoting individual liberty in our country. Thank you very much.